Grover Franklin Swift was the grandson of local whaling tycoon Elijah Swift. He grew up in what is now the Congregational Minister's house on the Village Green. His district school no longer exists, but his later school, Lawrence Academy, is now our Chamber of Commerce building. When he was an old man, Oliver wrote a memoir for his grandchildren, leaving them, and us, a picture of what childhood in Falmouth was like in 1850. In his own words, quote, When I first attended the district school, our teacher was Miss Harriet Butler, a most estimable Christian woman, full of good words and works. That we did not learn much from books was not her fault. I do know that we gain much from experience and our association with each other. That little schoolhouse, it seems as if I could see it now. It was situated on the crossroad between the Woods Hole and the West Falmouth Road, nearly opposite where the road turns up toward the Falmouth Railroad Depot. It was a small, brown, one-story building with three windows on a side and one at the back, all having green shutters. A beautiful, large, wild cherry tree hung its graceful branches over it, covering nearly half the roof. In the springtime, the birds were flitting among the leaves and hopping from branch to branch, singing their sweetest songs as if to welcome us to school. In the later summer, the boys and birds would vie with each other to see which would get the larger share of the little black cherries. Oh, my, with that. They were good. At this time, I said something that pleased my mother very much because she said it showed the dawn of intellect. <clears throat> Question. Why is a boy in the cherry tree like a certain bird? Answer. Because he is a robin, the cherry tree. When I commenced to attend school at Lawrence Academy, it was a happy time for me. There, my circle of acquaintances was very much enlarged. Joshua Robinson came up from Waquite, eight miles away, and rode a little black pony coming in the morning and going home after school. He was envied by all the boys. Tom Fish also came from Quisset, sometimes walking and bringing his dinner and often driving his father's horse. We were let out two hours earlier on Wednesday afternoon and we only had school in the forenoon on Saturdays, other days from 8.30 to 12 o'clock, and from 1 to 4.30 o'clock. Not much time left for play, you will say. I remember thinking I had the hardest time of any. Saturday morning, I had to split up kindlings for the fire in the brick oven. I couldn't go out to play in the afternoon until I had blackened all the shoes for the family for Sunday and had learned and recited my Sabbath school lesson to mother. Hmm. Ah, oh, we certainly did have some enjoyable times. As the days commenced to shorten, football was in order, as it is nowadays. Then we had no such contrivance or no game like the present. Our football was homemade. When the village butcher appeared with his overalls and a bundle and his big knives done up in an apron, a bunch of boys would surround him, each crying, give me the bladder, give me the bladder. The fortunate one, with a straw and the help of his friends, inflated it. After carefully tying a string below where the straw was inserted, it was the kind of football we used. In the game, each one, for the most part, worked for himself. The fastest runners and strongest boys usually get the best chance for the greatest number of kicks as we chase it up and down the field. The ball often came to an untimely end when a disappointed boy kicked, and to emphasize his displeasure, dropped a rock on the ball. It exploded with a loud sound, as if it was a squad of soldiers shooting a volley over the last resting place of a comrade. 